This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here, go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. Are you ready to feel the power? What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game today from the Cornhusker Nation out in the great state of Nebraska. We have Mr. Elliot Bassett from Ellerbrock Norris, but also launch cool new tool for producers that he has developed. Why? Because he's a producer that didn't have it and he knew you needed it so that's what we're going to wrap about for the next little bit but before we do elliot give them the backstory man talk a little bit about yeah. you your agency and where you came from yeah i'm not sure that i'm proud to say from the cornhusker state right now other than volleyball we, we've got volleyball so uh the Play rest whatever is, you can man that's hey we're gonna do that we're gonna do that so i've got a no, buddy yeah, that's a nebraska it. fan that is just like i mean i talked to him Terrible. all the time and he's just like and I, I'm an Ohio State guy, so we talked Big Ten, and he's just like, after about the second game of the year this year, he was just like, I am so depressed, and it's not uh, looking any better. Hey, can, like I amazing how throw, can, I, can I take the elephant out of the room here? I will never recognize Nebraska as a Big Ten school. I'm sorry. Or yeah, any of the other ones that they've added since they st- – it's not a Nebraska thing. It's just in general, man. No, you think wow. Nebraska, you think Nebraska, Oklahoma, and Big 12, yeah. and, and you know, the, the classic rivalries. And it's, it's just – it's getting to the point where, I mean, dude, the Big Ten just added UCLA and USC. Like, how, how does that make sense? Well, and they want to add two more. What, I know. It's just going to be a national 16-team conference. So yeah, it's I going to be Big that, Ten. Man. It's going to be Big Ten and SEC before too long. It's just going to they, you know, it, it, it's going to be uh, just a, a, a massive power conference situation, and it's going to get weird. Maybe yeah. they should just call it the massive power conference then, <laughs> instead of Big Ten, because they don't even have ten people. No, no it's weird that they do it. Right. That's now, my, and that's and my yeah, point. Like, why aren't you the Big Fourteen? <laughs> Hey, they, they just don't ask our opinion, David. Otherwise, we could fix that. But Yeah, well, they're not uh, getting my support as a result, so there's that too. <laughs> yeah, there's that too. So, um, No, yeah, I appreciate it. Our, our backstory, you know, we were, we're a 116-year-old firm out of Nebraska um, that, you know, six or seven years ago uh, implemented a new kind of sales process, which is very much what you talk about, David, discovery-based sales process. Um, and to your point, you know, didn't couldn't find the tools out there from a sales perspective that, allowed us to efficiently, productively uh, implement that, that process and also helping us put that in front of our clients, right? And differentiate ourselves in the marketplace uh, to ultimately get out and win new business. We knew that when we implemented the process, it works, um, but we wanted to be able to do it efficiently, productively, easily. And so Launch was born out of that. So a long history of selling, you know, insurance, insurance-related products um, have now expanded in what we do. And uh, very much taking that approach of let's figure out, identify problems for clients and go and solve those problems. And insurance will come along with that. Insurance is a big component of that. Um, but that can't be the end all be all. It's just the old copy quote pray, right? We're not going to differentiate very good that way. So that's kind of the, was the impetus of building launch. We we had a need for ourselves and then realized that there's a lot of other firms out there like us that, you know, would like something similar. So um, are out promoting it and taking it to market. It's been kind of fun. So what's, what's that look like? What, what's the, the promotion and taking it to market? Talk about that for a minute. <laughs> yeah, it's been, uh, it's been interesting. You know, I've never really ran, never have, not even really not never have ran a software company. And so it's yeah. a much different, uh, sales, sales process, sales, uh, 
um, marketing, everything like that, that we're learning as we go, but it's doing things like this, right? It's, it's just getting the message out of what we're doing. We feel like uh, we've built something that's pretty cool that solves a pretty big need in the industry that uh, people outside of, of us have. And it's just getting out and getting that message out, doing things like this, talking to different folks. I was just on with Mick Hunt, who I know you guys uh, are good friends with, and was on with him last week talking about, you know, his client base and how it can fit in and the tool that uh, we can build to help them uh, elevate their game as well. So it's just stuff like this, but it's, it's definitely different. It's uh it's been interesting. So it's been fun. Well, I mean, look, man, I'm going to go ahead and call it like I see it, like I typically do. Selling to insurance agents has to suck because there's some, <laughs> there's some of the most fickle people who have horrible short-term memories, right? Like they forget that they go out and do this every day. And I'll just go ahead and say it, people, y'all are rude most of the time. You know, <laughs> I, I hear it from a lot of vendors and you don't, you know, you don't appreciate the fact that somebody, I mean, I understand that we all get telemarketed to death. We all get emailed to death. We all get, you know, in mailed on LinkedIn to death. But at the end of the day, if you know, when, when we're on the phone with people who have something that can make our lives better, you need to give them the benefit of the doubt and pay attention, especially when they've walked a mile in our shoes before. It's just like Todd Tams with Mod Advisor. How in the world is that not in every single agency that sells workers' comp in the country, right? Why are yeah. we doing that? Number one, why isn't any software in there? So let's just go ahead and call it. There are other people out there. but So why don't they have somebody, number one? But more importantly, why aren't we supporting the people that are agents? You know, agent tech is huge. Indie tech, whatever we want to call it, it's a huge opportunity. And I think that a lot of times we think that, well, that's just an agent who couldn't sell. So they're coming out with the tool to try and try and make it better as opposed to, well, here's somebody who obviously has been able to close business. I need to find out more about how they were able to do that. Right. That's the first piece of it. And part of the problem is, you know, we know it. We know it because we get hammered on all social media, but specifically, it seems like Facebook is really bad with just random people. Random, like I, I, I get friend requests. I'm so important. I get so many friend requests every day. <laughs> all the pretty people uh, want to talk to me. Well, no, I mean, that's not what I'm saying, but you know, I go in and it's like you get hit with one first family life guy or lady. Next thing you know, you got 30 requests in your inbox. Like, I want to know what that system is, number one. Yeah. And number two, why they think it works, because all I do is hit delete 30 times. Yep. I'm not interested in that, <laughs> but it, it, it's that. It's it's the the online. The, hey, people, guess what? I know I'm fat, okay? I don't need some guy that has an online training program through Facebook to reach out to me to show me how to lose weight. I know how to lose weight. You go ass. to the gym, you eat right. End of story. Yeah. Thank no. you. He, no, Thanks, guy. Great him. business model. I'm sure there's some other fat guy that's sitting out there waiting for you to call that wants to have a trainer over Facebook. But I also regardless, think it's like like agency owners are kind of cheap though too, right? I mean, they like, are. They're very have, cheap. Yeah. You don't know how good you got it. Well, no, I'm, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's like kind of a weird. All I have is experience here, so I don't really have much room to talk on. But just kind of from observing, it's kind of funny because I feel like we bitch about you know, clients and, and insureds, you know, complaining about price and, and buying on price, but then we got agents. Yeah, we do. yeah, it's kind of funny. 100%. It is. It's for yeah. how much, how much does it cost? How much does it cost? Nobody ever stops and says, how much does it make me? How much is this going to bring in revenue in my agency? Because if you're focusing on the top line, eventually there's going to be just what, what happens to margins. If your cost is fixed, they get bigger and yeah. bigger and bigger. The more that top you line solves well, all problems. Yeah, the more business that you write using that tool that's on it. Look, we were on a webinar with Mineral right before this. It was a free webinar that I did talking about using current HR trends to leverage PNC opportunities. We love Mineral in our agency. I specifically love it because I pay one flat fee for the year and I can give it to whoever I need to have it. I can give it to clients. I can give it to prospects. But the whole point of it was we're all going, you know, people go out and they sell insurance. That's all they do is sell insurance, period. Like, it, like you said, quote, 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 you don't get any kind of serious conversion numbers that way. Well, you're it's never about... going to have, you're never going to have a 95, 95% <clears throat> close ratio, 
quoting to get business. It's just not oh, going to no. happen. Your attention is never going to be that high because your net new, your, your net new may be a, a, above where you were, you know, last year, but you've lost business as a result and new business is coming on. So that's a, that's a big anomaly, man. Just because your net new is ahead doesn't mean you have good retention. You could have lost 20% of your book, but if you add 30, your net new shows 10. So yeah, I just I think it's interesting oh. that we get so caught up in the cost of things instead of the value or what things are going to make us. And, you know, that's the thing. And those are the same people that are out there. I see them in all of the different forums online complaining about, oh, I lost an account to somebody who come in, came in and had this magic HR tool. Nah, it's not really magic. It's the one I've been talking about for two years on the podcast that you don't think matters. And now I just took an account from you using that exact tool. You don't have anybody to blame but yourself, right? We can put all of this stuff out there and we can share it with everybody. But at the end of the day, if you're just going to sit there and not use any of it or not do anything with it, I don't know, it just it really gets under my skin and it almost gets under my skin as bad as when they actually do pull the trigger and they buy the product, don't but they don't do anything with it. And then, <laughs> yeah. then it's, then it's, the, then it's the software's it fault. Yeah. yeah. It's the software's fault. Software didn't work. Well, no, it didn't work because you never launched it. Yeah. Hey, speaking of which, so you <clears> said <throat> launch. Yeah, there you go. No, I, I would encourage everybody to think about it. I mean, David, you could probably speak to this more than I too, but I think, Years ago, it used to be you could differentiate with a different carrier or some sort of program or things like that. Their, their carriers were more specific to a degree. Now, I think it's, you everybody's can, like, got if you have everybody. Erie, like if you have, yeah. if you're an Erie There's agency, a few. it's a, a sort of a pseudo captive type relationship. And I don't, I don't mean that in any negative way. I just know that my friends who have uh, agencies with Erie write the, the overwhelmingly majority, overwhelming majority of their business with Erie. And Erie yeah. doesn't complain about that. In fact, they encourage that. So if I'm if I'm an Erie agent and I'm going in to compete against somebody and they don't have Erie, then I do think that I've got a really good shot of winning because of everything that I've ever heard about them. Now, that's complete conjecture on my part because I'm in Florida. Erie's not and I've never written a single policy <laughs> with them. But I, I, I do know the people in my network have always you know, they've always said that I think that auto owners is like that to a certain yeah. degree, um, you know, in our agency. And we do have them. And, and I can tell you, I was just on the phone. You know, right uh, in between this in the webinar that I did, I had a, a new business of a call. By the way, stop right here, right now. Kyle, do you trouble. miss Marvin or do you love Hassan? Dude, Hassan's crushing it. I talked to him earlier today. He uh, he was like, he, he, he sent me an email. He's like, hey, you, you know, you have a few minutes? I'm like, sure, whatever. And he's like, yeah, man, it's just been a while since we talked, but hey, I'm, I'm doing this, this, and this, and I just booked two appointments for you today. So he got two on the calendar. <laughs> he booked, for me he booked four for you yesterday, according to his email. He told me he booked it, you four. He well, yes, he did for for like next week and for later this week. But then he booked two more for me specifically, like today, this afternoon. Yeah, no, that's what I, that's what. I, oh, he the, he booked the appointment, and it's for this afternoon. Two of them, yeah. And <laughs> um, there you and he go. Was just like he's like, you need anything from me? I was like. No, man, just keep doing what you're doing. It seems like you're, uh, you, you're, you're finding a That's groove. Awesome. I'll, I'll say that the only thing that I am going to do for you is like when it starts slowing down a little bit, like next week for Thanksgiving and all that, I'm going to get in there and I just haven't had a chance. I'm going to get in there and go through all the, uh, get weed all the bad shit out of there and get some stuff that's a little bit more qualified so that he's not wasting time calling a two person, you know, whatever. Well, I can tell you this, man, I have been on, um, he obviously is not booking as many for me because my schedule doesn't allow him to do it, but I've been on a number of appointments. I, I mean, probably four or five. I've, I've actually had the calls with them. Yeah. One of them was a no show emailed the guy, never heard back from him and said, whatever guy you just, yeah. Okay. So you're lost. Yeah. You're teach, teaching me a lesson, you know, <laughs> thanks for not calling me back to help you fix whatever jacked up problems you have number, but, but every other account that I, every other one that I've called has been fantastic. And it's interesting too, because the last one I talked to today was a plumbing company and their comp just renewed. So he was calling off of the comp X dates and it renewed like October 23rd or whatever. And the other cool part about this one is these people were actually on zoom. Like they didn't go to the phone. They actually showed up to the Zoom meeting. Oh, so, there you go. So we had the we had the conversation on Zoom and um, it was a plumbing company. It wasn't huge. It was, you know, 20, 25 people, but a number of, yeah, it's going to fit still, right. Still you know, solid. Yeah. And it, will, yeah. it will ultimately grow to be exactly 
right. where I want it to be. It's still going to be over a hundred thousand dollars in premium, I would imagine. But like, we're going back and forth in the conversation, you know, and this guy's like, yeah, I don't have a handbook. Yeah, no, we don't, we don't really have a, an, a formal training program or whatever else. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, am I recording this call? Please, for the love of God, <laughs> let me record this call because I'll put it out is social posts showing people I'm really having these conversations that I tell you I am. And guess what? They really work. So what's going to happen from this? He's sending me over a copy of everything that he has in place. Comp just renewed October 23rd. The GL and the auto comes up in March and April, but he's wanting to, he's wanting to get the process started and make the move as soon as possible. So of course I'm going to have that. And you know what else I told him? Everybody listening to this is you're going to, they're going to shriek when they hear it. I actually said this verbatim. And when you send me the information, save yourself the time and don't black out the premiums. <laughs> Good for you. I said, I told him, I'm like, you know, let me, but here's the thing. I, I was, this is a hot button for me today. Anyhow, I've said it three or four times. Here's the reason why that's, that's the, that I think that you need to say that to your client. They don't know why you need it. Right. Oh, agents, they need agents to be educated. Yeah. Agents don't go in and say, Hey, by the way, you know, I need you to send me what you've got. Please don't black out the premiums. And the reason why is, you know, no, they just go in and say, I need your de your deck pages and your loss runs. We'll throw some accords together and we'll put the loss runs in there and we'll send it off to an underwriter. And we're going to hope they're going to quote it. They don't take the time to read the loss runs to see what the story is that those are telling you, which are going to ultimately tell you everything you need to know about the account for the most part. And the premiums are blacked out. So let's just say you want to take the extra step, even though I know you won't, and do a premium versus <laughs> loss summary. What are you going to bear? What are you going to base it on? You're going to guess the premium? You don't have it now. And people don't realize that the reason why underwriters want, I love it when I listen to an agent bitch about why an underwriter needs a target premium. Well, if you don't give them a target premium and all you do is give them loss runs, they're going to use the loss information to back into their rate. And they have no idea of knowing whether or not they're even remotely close. At least give them an idea of where it's at. You'll save everybody, including yourself, a lot of headache and heartache of going back and forth just because you want to be stingy. What do you think they're going to give you their best rate because you were uncooperative with them and giving them information. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life, but that's how they <laughs> operate. Oh, no, yeah. I'm not giving my underwriter a target premium. It's none of their business. They need to sharpen oh. the pencil and give me the best thing they have. All right, buddy. Good luck. Have fun selling those bops while you're at it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree with you. And I think it's, it's all about the value around the product anymore, right? It's what, so you talked in there, you've talked about mineral, you've talked about employee handbooks that you're doing. You've talked about things outside of insurance that you're going to help the client. I'm trying to give you a big softball, business. man. I'm trying to lob you a big softball. <laughs> I'm, so you I'm working into it, you know, and, uh, <laughs> but no, but that's true. We need to focus around what is the value we're bringing outside of the insurance product? Cause as we just said, you know, outside of maybe an Erie or an auto owners, the carrier is not the differentiator anymore we have to build our value props. And that's that's ultimately what you know we talk about when we discuss launch or any of these other products is what's the value prop that we want to create? You know, some firms that might be for, like you're talking, David, it might be mineral. That could be a great piece of your value prop. Others, it could be, you know, things you're helping solve around safety or uh, OSHA compliance or, whatever, or all of that combined. And But we have to look at having a value prop and not let it be the carrier's value prop anymore. And I think that's, one of the biggest things I still see in the industry that just kills me. And I think it's why firms are seeing the low conversion rates. They're seeing they can't grow the way that they want. They're not retaining business. It's because you don't have a value prop. It's the carrier's value prop that you're relying on, whether that be pricing or claim service or whatever we've all heard over the years. Um, that's the carrier's value prop. That's not you. Anybody can go out and get that value prop that has that, that carrier contract. So I think it's all about what are you doing outside of that, around that insurance product that brings value. Well, and look, I'm going to go ahead and make a statement that's going to get me in trouble with insurance carriers. <laughs> but at the end of the day, what real value proposition do carriers have that is articulated succinctly at the point of sale and then subsequently executed after the fact? And I'm being dead serious when I say this. You're not like it, it, they, it's just not there. Now, look, let me backpedal a little bit and say there are workers comp carriers that give you yep. access to think HR. There, there is a workers' comp carrier out there that gives you access to KPA. There are, you know, fleet safety training and ergonomic training and oh. resources and things like that. But when it comes down to it, you still have to know what to ask for, right? You have Bingo. to know 
they, they have number one, you got to know that the carrier has it. Number two, you got to know that the prospect or the client needs it. And if all you're doing is focusing on insurance, listen, I'm going to make a bold statement here. I'm willing to bet that 99.999% of these people, everybody, including the three of us on this podcast, have filled out an accord form before and answered the yes, no questions without ever asking their client. I'll, I'll be the first to stand up and say, I've done it. Oh, everybody. Right. Yeah. Everybody has done that. Do you realize that you could actually learn a ton about your client if you actually ask the questions on the accord? Like you don't want to be the guy that, or the lady that said, no, we don't have an employee, any employees over 60. And then old Maud from receiving trips over, <sighs> ah. a, you know, a pallet in the back go into banger, you know, banger heater on the loading dock, right? Breaks her hip. Workers comp carrier comes and says, this lady's 72 working as a receiving clerk. You never told us this. In fact, here's your accord form showing where that wasn't the case. Is the claim going to be covered? Maud. Yeah, but it's going to make you look stupid and mod strikes again. But I mean, <laughs> it's, it's the same thing, man. We don't ask the basic questions to uncover the <laughs> problems we need to solve because the only problem we're solving is get cheaper insurance. Well, I'd take it a step further, man. I'd say ask the basic questions, but ask better questions. You know, those questions on the accord are yes, no. So it's like, do you have a safety program? Well, everybody's going to answer yes. I've never heard anybody say no. Well, like, what if we just ask, tell me about your safety program? You know, then you're going to actually learn what's this person doing from a safety perspective mm -hmm. um, that could be making them a safer organization, or you're going to find out real quick if they just put together a safety program 10 years ago and have never looked at it again. It's a very Which is different the case. Yeah, 100%. But it opens up a total opportunity to drive value just by asking that question uh, or going down that path, right? Because if we can bring them things like mineral has tons of uh, to use that example, has tons of uh, resources that you can use around that. You know, the, the 800 pound girl that everybody seems to have is Zywave. They've got a ton of those resources, but just you can provide a ton of value just by uncovering those, um, asking better questions around those areas and uncovering those needs, right? But the open ended questions. At, 100%. Just, just get them to, talking. Because exactly. even if it's not, if, even if it's not, something that you had in mind to ask them that was one of those yes or no questions by them just starting to talk and enroll a little bit they're a either going to get right to where you were looking for anyways or they're going to come up with something that you may not have ever even thought to ask or or didn't know was an issue totally i 100 agree and i would always also uh encourage everybody to come up with a consistent set of these questions that you ask for you know your plumbing contractors or your uh, manufacturers or whatever have a an assessment built you know david talks about this all the time and he's been doing it for so long he just knows all the questions that he's going to ask and the conversations to have uh, if you haven't been doing it for 20 years come up with your list of open-ended questions that you want to ask that are about these different topics and areas and by the way you can gather all the information that you need to fill out a court apps to do everything you need to do in a 30 to 40 minute converse open-ended conversation with a client because they're going to give you gold on everything that you need. And that's the way that you're going to actually drive those conversations deeper. You know, it's not going to be, Hey, do you have any employees that are over 60? It's going to be, tell me about your workforce. Like what's your age demographics? You know, how are you handling this? Da, 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 da. And that's going to get you to where you need to get. But ultimately it takes having that consistent process to get there. Well, so let me ask you this, man. You've been talking to a lot of agencies around launch. You've been an agent and you know, a producer yourself. You know, my God, your agent, Methuselah probably bought his homeowner's policy from your agency <laughs> originally. But, um, you know, how many agencies that you talk to actually have a defined sales process? And the reason why I'm asking this is twofold. Number one, because I already know the answer. But number two, I want to hear your insight because as soon as we're done recording this podcast, I'm jumping on to Billy Williams fix uh, fix your agency workshop, and I'm that's exactly what I'm talking about. So nice. I'm I'm interested in um, I'm interested in in what you're seeing and how many agencies actually have definition ha have a sales process. Number one, or say they do, and then number two, actually have it defined. And then here's the, here's the double jeopardy, you know, bonus round question and are able to articulate it, right? Like those are the, do you <laughs> it gets have less it? with is each one. Mind? Yeah. Can you articulate it? I'm, I'm, I'm just interested because people are going to be reaching out to you 
you know, to talk about launch and how it can help them specifically with, with commercial production in the middle market, you know, how, how, um, sophisticated do they have to be to be able to reach out to you and use that tool? Yeah, well, that's, so to answer your questions, I would say, you know, probably half of those that we talk to say they've got a defined sales process and can actually articulate it. Um, those that, or, or can actually, you know, discuss it. Those that are actually articulating and implementing said sales process is probably 10 to 20% tops. Hmm. Um, and that's, they're, they, they, they've created this meeting structure, right? Or, or whatever they want to do in their sales process, but their agents aren't following it. It becomes difficult because they've got to go to the, get their assessment over here and pull in questions from this. And then they're just like, oh, screw it. I'll just go and get, get the apps and, you know, send it into a couple of carriers and see if I can win the deal. You know, it always ends up where it's, it's not implemented effectively throughout the, the organization. And that's the beauty though, of what we've built with launch. And, and ultimately those were some of the things that we were running into is it just walks you through the sales process. So you just have to follow what the system tells you to do essentially. And you're going to walk through a discovery based sales process with that client. You're going to have uh, an assessment that you can walk through. You, the system is going to score that assessment for you and for your prospect. Uh, it's going to provide visuals and reports for you to show your prospect as how they scored and what you need to do to improve their score. And then it provides a simple tool to build out the client plan. How are you going to improve in those areas so that you can go for that BOR or you can go to get higher? And so to answer your question, I mean, it's, it's not very many firms that actually truly have a defined sales process, but I do see a lot of firms that um, want to, they want to get better in that area. They want to create more consistency and they know that by doing that, they're going to be able to differentiate, win more business with their clients. And so it becomes a, a natural conversation around launch when we're having those conversations. Where I'd be curious you... if that's what you were thinking. Go ahead. Yeah. Thoughts on... I, well, there's a couple of things. Number one, I think that um, a, a lot of the times, and I hear this a lot from killing commercial too, right? where people are like, ah, I just don't know if I'm ready. I don't know if I'm far enough along. I don't know if I know. Every Listen, people, if you're going to wait until everything's perfect, the only thing that's going to be perfect is that zero in your <laughs> bank account because you never started to begin with, right? And it's never about being perfect and knowing everything and all of that. You don't have to have the most sophisticated tools and tricks in your book. You just need to know how to work hard and be consistent. And then you can lean on tools and other people that are going to help you, you know, along the way. And so, you know, I can tell you, even with mod advisor as an example, if you've never audited a mod before, there's a hundred percent chance Todd Tams is going to make sure you understand how to audit a mod using Mod Advisor. He's going to show you in his demo, and he's probably going to offer to help you with one or two of them, you know, down the road if you if you end up needing help after you buy the the software. And Todd's a nice enough guy; he may do a real one for you before you buy his software, just because he believes that much in his product and the difference it'll make in your agency. I think you're in a similar boat, right? I think that honestly, if, if I'm if I'm an agency principal and I'm not in the middle market, or maybe I have been and I'm floundering a little bit, I think that coming to you and talking to you about what launch is able to do is actually exactly what I need to be doing because <laughs> I don't have to be an expert. I don't have to know everything. Bingo. You're gonna you're I will become that way because I look at this as twofold, man. Number one, it's helping you ask the right questions and good questions at the point of sale. But it's also kind of like a subliminal learning management system for producers yeah. because you're only going to have to use launch so many times for certain types of risk where you're asking those questions before you know all the questions. Now, you're going to need to use it consistently consistently over time because of some of the other features that it has. But I'm just saying, if you're not comfortable, that's, you know. I don't, remember, I don't even know if it's still around. I think it's finally something that now Rough Notes has endorsed and it's white labeled on Zywave or whatever, but it, the, um, you know what I'm talking about? It's like the risk, uh, the risk snapshots or whatever, yeah. when you go out and it, when I started, it was Sage and silver plume that had that, right. It was, it was silver plume was the product and you would go and I could put in, um, you know, uh, a sawmill or whatever. And it, it's going to give me like every coverage, every risk management question, yeah. all of that stuff. Well, you know, if I write five or six sawmills, I'm going to start to remember about 50% of those questions and I don't have to spend as much time, 
you know, trying to prepare because I know what I'm doing. And then over time, you just get better and better and better at that to the point where you're not really having to use a tool to help you with the questioning. It becomes but, a conversation. Yeah, but it's been such a habit yeah. at that point. You're still doing it to make sure you don't miss anything, but you're it's, it's much more conversational. Yeah. And that's that's the thing, man. Like, even though I'm a little rusty and I don't do as much in the new business as what I used to, I still take new business appointments. I still can have a conversation without anybody realizing that I'm actually getting questions answered that they don't, they don't even know I'm asking the question. I mean, obviously they know I'm asking a question, but they don't understand the intent behind it. Like not an hey, interrogation. Yeah. Just out of curiosity. I mean, labor market's tough right now. How are, how are, how are things going with staffing? Oh, good. Well, so out of curiosity, what's the hiring process look like? Are you using recruiters? What are, Oh, really? And when you bring somebody on board, how do you onboard them? Like I'm, I'm going right down the line of everything, every problem I can solve with mineral without ever bringing mineral up. Okay. I can, I can employ handbook policies and procedures. It's all there. That's the beauty of what you guys have put together. And I mean, I can't even imagine what it looks like now. Cause it's been a couple months since I've seen it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's, there is so a few things that I think would, you'd be particularly interested in, but we're even using it on the marketing side for lead gen. Now we're, we're able to take some of those questions that you might be asking and throw them into an online assessment and the you know, prospect can actually get a score and then be routed to you to reach out to them and say, Hey, you know what? We saw that you were X, Y, Z, you know, why don't you go through our full assessment on blah, 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 blah. And we'll see what that actually looks like, what your risk score is in this area. So we're using it for a lot of lead gen right now, which has been, been really impactful. Yeah. I think the online assessment approach is something that is going to become more and more popular because it doesn't invade somebody's time to do that they can pick and choose when they do it. And if they have a problem big enough for them to do the assessment, that's already enough of a buyer signal for me. And I mean, to, to prove that point, this is something that we've been doing with cyber forever. Like once you started being able to get cyber assessments from the carrier as part of the quoting process, we just market for getting a complimentary cyber assessment. Now yeah, they can yeah. go, now they can go to the iframe that we put on the Florida Risk Partners website. They can answer like five or six questions. I'm going to get alerted because they've been to that page. I'm also going to get a notification when Pro Riders has done their piece and I'm going to get the, 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 um, quotes from five to seven carriers, the coverage comparison on a single document that's going to allow me to look for the things like pay on behalf of versus yeah. reimbursement, sublimits to malware, you know, all of those things. I can see that in one snapshot, but it's also going to provide me with the cyber risk report for each one of the carriers that actually does that. So, you know, I don't know if you know this or not, um, but we, I started another agency um, with some partners and it's actually them, but, um, you know, they, we've got some pretty proprietary stuff we're doing specific to software as a service companies cover your SAS is our, is our agency hundred oh, yeah. percent digital online. Um, and you know, we lead by going to SAS companies and just soliciting them for complimentary cyber risk assessment. Now I will tell you those tools are much more proprietary. They we are not using a carrier it is, it is like a legit deep dive. This would cost you a lot of money to get this. And we give it to them. And guess what? We write business, man. You know, Abe is over there. Yeah, Abe is over there crushing it. He's 24 years old, never written a policy in his life. Main reason why he asked me to be part of it is just to sort of be his handler because he's a lot like I was when I was that young, um, way more hyperness than knowledge. And so, <laughs> You know, he's going to go out and he's going to make the calls and he's going to get in front of these people. But when he's going back to them and providing this risk assessment, these people, 100 percent of them are coming back and saying, we need to talk. Why? Why are they doing that? Because agents aren't right. They're buying their insurance from somewhere. Most of the time, they just go online and buy it and they don't even know what they're buying. Now, the fact that we're going to come in, we're going to give them something for free. They're probably skeptical when they request it and think, eh, this isn't going to be that valuable. Yeah. Then they get like a 50 page report that actually goes into things that none of the uh, cyber reports come from do with the carriers. And they're like, wow, these guys are legit. I probably need to talk to them. It's not the mom, it's not the, you know, the small upstart, let's go place it with Hartford and we're going to throw the professional extension on there and all of that. These are actual like middle market software companies, but the online lead gen by leading with an assessment is huge. 
people want to know what's wrong with their business. It's the most important thing to them outside of their family in most cases. So if you have give them any reason at all to believe there may be a chink in the armor, they're going to be willing to they're going to be willing to explore that, especially if they don't have to pay for it or talk to anybody in the process. Yeah, I think part of the um, the key for the cyber assessment, too, is that it's like you said, it's like five or six questions. It's not something where they've got to sit there for a half hour and and dig out a bunch of reports and, and find something like they can pretty much fly through that and, and get immediate feedback and, and not only feedback, but like solutions to what the issue is. Exactly. Well, and I think people ultimately want to be educated. You know, right now they want, we all have information at our fingertips. We want to be able to do some research and, you know, get out there and kind of see what, feel this out a little bit and learn a little bit about it. And then when I'm ready, I'll, I'll engage the expert, right. Or I'll bring in the person that I feel like is best apt to handle this particular issue for me, but we need to be viewing us way more in that light than we do as salespeople. We need to educate people as to how should you be looking at risk? What should you be thinking about when it comes to cyber? How should you be viewing onboarding and hiring and whatever in your business, educate them. They're going to be able to connect the dots to their business and be like, well, we haven't done that. Nobody, my current guy's not talking to me about that, you know, and, and then you present a plan and you present the solutions to them and say, very specifically, here's how we're going to solve these issues that we just talked about. You're going to win those deals all day long because people want to feel like they're with a partner being you know, educated and solving problems that they have. Yep. You know, it feels like that's what you're doing with that, David, where you're showing them through that assessment process that, hey, you've got these particular issues. Here's your report. You know, If you want to move forward to the next up step to help solve these particular areas, We'd love to engage you in doing that, you know, or however you guys approach it, but Mm -hmm. you can do all those same things. I mean, imagine doing that across all your other lines of business, right? I mean, that's what we can do with launches. It's easy to set those things up where you can set them up custom to questions that you want to ask. You can set them up, you know, we have pre-built assessments in there where if you want to talk to a contractor about X, Y, Z, you just run through the list of questions. You can put them out on a landing page like David's talking about and have a lead gen site ready to go tomorrow. So it really makes it pretty turnkey to be doing all these things we're talking about. Yeah, I agree. So talk a little bit about, um, well, I don't know, man, this is kind of your deal. Let, I mean, what else do we want to talk about regarding launch that we haven't yet? Well, I'd be curious. The One of the biggest things I think that we miss in our industry, and I'd be curious how you do it, David, and then we can talk about maybe how launch does it, but quantification of that risk, right? So how do we help the client connect the dots to how much is this going to cost me or where do I sit compared to other for, you know, other companies in this area or whatever? It's one thing, you know, that's the first step of any good discovery process, right? Sales process is identifying those particular areas that, that they have problems in. But then how do we make sure that they quantify the impact to their business if they don't do anything to solve for these particular areas? Or maybe what it's already been costing them. You know, I'd be curious to approach that. Yeah, no, I think I think that's one that's a little bit more difficult because it it depends on line of coverage and everything. And there's a couple of different ways for me to answer the question. So as far as you're saying quantification, we do a baseline risk assessment and it's a score. You know, it's it's it goes line by line by line. It's not computerized, it's manual but they rate themselves on a one through 10 based on uh, probably 25 different things that we've identified for that industry that we want to know what their, you know, what, what, what the risk profile is, is what I call it. And so um, I specifically do that with the leadership. I do it with the mid-level management and I do it with some hourly frontline employees. Um, I want them to each grade how they feel the organization's doing so that I have an idea up front of what their perception of their health of the organization is. I don't want to go in and tell somebody, you guys really suck if they've rated themselves 10 out of 10. Even (laughs) if they really suck, the messaging needs to be softer in that situation. If they grade themselves a four and I've got them a six or a seven, that's an easier conversation. And people sometimes are harder on themselves than you're going to be on them. But we do that. And I don't necessarily do it myself. Most of the time, I will, uh, unless it's something I'm really, really comfortable in, you put me in a grocery store, I'll do it 110 out of 10 times. I'll do it. But if you take me someplace like a resort 
you know, that's got a lot of different exposures, then I'm going to bring somebody in that is either been a risk manager at a resort or a loss control person for a property management company or something along those lines through Yellowbird because it makes it so much easier. I can just go into the Yellowbird app, create the job, pay them, let them match me to the absolute perfect person to do it. Then they're going to send me the report when I'm done, co-branded with our logo on it so that we have the ability to go deliver that. But they're going to use, in many cases, they're going to ask me, do you want to use our our, our uh, product uh, to do this or do you want yours? I'm going to want them to use ours, but they can they can use theirs and translate to mine for point of sale if they want. But, um, you know, that's that piece of it. The other piece of it, though, I mean, that's literally just assigning a score as, as far as what I would say either a percent of compliance, meaning how effective execution of, of programs is, or uh, just a severity score, right? Like if it's something really bad, we're going to give it a one. And this is how bad it's so bad. We're going to give it a one or whatever. And so you can quantify that way. The other thing though, that I think a lot of people don't realize, especially when you're dealing with middle market accounts is that you can quantify a lot of this stuff around losses that have already happened and people don't think about that. And I'm going to give you a very specific story about this and how I used it, because I think that this is the way that producers should be thinking when they're out there at the point of sale. But I've got an account. I've talked about it a few times on the podcast. It's a resort over um, in the Orlando area, about 45 minutes from the office here. Um, and I went in and we were having the conversation originally about soft costs associated with workers' compensation claims. And, you know, the statistic that I've always used literally from the time I came into the industry, I can't imagine that it's improved. It's probably gotten worse, but it was on the Bureau of Labor Statistics and in several other places that the soft costs associated with claims can be reasonably projected to be anywhere between two and 20 times the direct costs. Okay. Now, if you're going to email me, ask me for the website where I found that I just told you, you know, I've been using that my entire career. Um, very few times have people argued with me over it. And if you actually took the time to look at you know, did a soft cost calculation associated with a claim, you're going to realize these numbers are, are pretty accurate. But for purposes of presentation in a sales conversation, I always use two because it's the one that nobody can argue with, right? I mean, meaning you're, you're a best in class risk management company if your soft costs are only 2X as opposed to 20. So I was in talking to this company and it was like a conference room full. We had like probably 12, 15 people around the the table and we'd been, we had been going for an hour and a half, two hours. And we got to the point where we started talking about soft costs associated with claims. And I said, you know, it, it's reasonably um, accurate to project. It's going to be two and 20 times direct costs. And the VP of ops stops me and says, no, nah, I don't think so. And I said, well, what are you talking about? She goes, well, we had 200,000 worth of claims last year. That means we had 400,000 in, in soft costs associated with it. And I said, Best case. Said, yeah, okay. Say, in a good said, okay. She goes, well, I don't agree with that number. And I said, well, that's good because I don't either. It's actually probably much higher. And, and, <laughs> and we went, we went back and forth and she, this lady kept digging her heels in, you know, that I didn't know what I was talking about. I wasn't right. And I finally said, look, you know, let me take a deep breath and help you understand the argument you want me to believe. What you're asking me to believe is that your account has an F on your experience mod, it's a 2.23 is your experience Ooh. mod, but somehow you're best in class in soft cost containment and workers' compensation claims. There's nobody that's going to buy that argument. <laughs> yeah. And, and I said, just the fact that there's 12 to 15 of us, I'm the only one that's not on the clock for your resort at this table. Every single one of these people are here to deal with the risk management <laughs> issue. Figure out their hourly rate for two hours, add it up, and that's soft costs associated with claims because that's why we're here. We're talking about it. I said, but to be more practical, you know, I know that you're not at capacity right now. I know that you're not getting to your room capacity because you're short staffed in housekeeping because it's a tough labor market and you've had too many people get injured that are out of work and you're not turning your rooms every day. And I said, so how much does that cost the resort on a daily, weekly, monthly, annual basis, right? If you can't maximize the number of rooms you're selling because you can't get them cleaned and turned to do that, that's a big problem. I said, so let's, let's figure out how to solve it. Talk to, me about, talk to me about the average day in housekeeping, because this is where the majority of the claims are. What does it look like when somebody comes to work? And so they told me, and I actually got in a golf cart, rode around with a couple of people in housekeeping, 
different stages of the day, watched how they were doing their work and everything, having conversation, because I'm always going to be a believer. You can learn more about a company by smoking a cigarette on the loading dock with the receiving clerk, Maud in this instance. Yeah. <laughs> then you're ever going to learn. Yeah. Then you're ever going to learn in a conference room, right? You're, you're just not going to get the same information because people are too worried about putting lipstick on the pig. So, you know, I wrote around, I learned, and, and what I found out was everybody comes in every day. They have a quick huddle to talk about safety and like they should, and they weren't doing it just because I was there. I know that they do that. But then they leave and they go and they get their cart and they get the empty bottles off from the day before and they fill the cleaning solution uh, that they need to have in several bottles. They also have these amenity bags that have the soap, the shampoo, mouthwash, all of that in the amenity bag. They would stuff how many of those they needed for the number of rooms that were in their block to clean for that day. It was like an hour to an hour and a half of them doing those kinds of non, non-productive, in my opinion, activities before they ever started. And so- I'm sitting here thinking to myself, this doesn't make any sense. If I take an hour and a half per crew across the number of crews, we're losing X number of man hours every single day. So I said to them, I said, just out of curiosity, why can't we put a folding table up in the housekeeping area and have the chemicals and everything sitting there and the raw, the, the materials they need to put in the amenity bags. And we can have light duty employees come back that were injured. They can sit at a table all day, stuff in amenity bags. We can have back stock on that. It doesn't cost us anything. We can have them fill up the bottles so that when, and, and actually put them back on the carts when the people come back in or they can do it themselves but then when your housekeeping crew comes in at the beginning of the day they're literally having the huddle to talk about safety do their team stretches and all of that then they're off to the races because the cart's already stocked and they're starting cleaning so much faster and you would have thought that i had just invented the next spacex spacex <laughs> rocket when i said that but what happened is they freed up you know 15 to 20 man hours every single day which allowed them to go through get more rooms cleaned. In fact, almost all of the rooms cleaned. They turned more and they were able to rent more, which means the revenue shot up. That's the kind of business, that's the kind of advice people need from us. They don't need you to sell them a policy and make sure you have the blanket additional insured endorsement on it. They don't care if they're going to be out of business. They need you to go in and figure out ways that you can quantify the misfortunes that have happened outside of the numbers on the loss run and articulate it in such a way by making a business case that it's just common sense and they almost smack themselves for not coming up with it on their own. <laughs> but we're so worried about going in and selling a policy. I, I said it on one of my killing commercial calls with an agency earlier today. Thank God we're not doctors, man. If I went into an insurance <laughs> agent that was in a doctor's office and I said, Oh man, I'll tell you, I have a little bit of a little bit of discomfort right here on the left side of my chest. They're going to pull out the saw, spread your ribs and start massaging your heart without ever asking you a question if an insurance agent was the doctor <laughs> instead of just saying, "Oh, what'd you have for lunch?" or "How long has this been?" Nothing. We're so we we feel so confident that the answer is selling a policy that we just go there and that's why we don't close nearly as much business. I'm done talking for a while. You guys can have fun. <laughs> you're fired up today, dude. Yeah, I like up. it. <laughs> but you're spot on. And, and you know, and the when I going back to that quantification, in that in that case, you're quantifying the soft cost to that employer. And I would imagine you get to the end of that, and it's a no brainer to move their insurance, right? Uh, or to hire you to help them solve those particular issues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, no, that you've done that for a long time. It probably comes almost second nature to you anymore, but there are other ways to quantify risk to the to the client. We need a way to make it tangible, right? That's the biggest thing. There's plenty of ways to do it. You mentioned the one to 10 scale. You know, I've seen firms just put questions in an Excel doc, put a one, two, three, four, always use a positive number of responses, by the way. You never want it to be average, which if you do a one to five, there can be average of three. There'll always be a three if you do that. Uh, always do a, a, a positive number. So one to four, one to six, so they have to be above or below average. It's a little psychological trick, um, but I've seen people just do that in an Excel doc. You know, hold on, Kyle. Kyle's squinting. I'm going to help you with some basic math here, Kyle, <laughs> or basic mathematic concepts. What he's saying is, if you have it one through five, three is the median because it's in the middle. So you can either fall above or below it. When you have two through four, there isn't a median. The median's probably like two, right? It's <laughs> halfway between two and four, but well, you're not. Yes. You're not in between either of the two. Okay. If you have a one to five, what we've always found is 
people 90% you pick the, you of the, pick the middle number three. i get that yeah. I, I guess i was thinking about two being halfway to four and yeah no i as i was going through my example of using four it became very <laughs> evident why you were squinting in real time oh, okay <laughs> great so there you go but it works for your for your prospects too because they'll they'll think about that they'll be like well am i a two or a three and they have to pick one right yeah. um so i've seen simple ones like that right or like in launch we've done it where uh, it's on a zero to a thousand scale. And we did it on that scale because risk is complex. We want to actually be able to weight the impact of some of these questions. So questions about the mod factor on a contractor are going to be weighted much more heavily in the scoring metric than say questions about their property or whatever else we might be asking about. Um, so we, we put it on a, a zero to a thousand scale. But again, I think the biggest thing here is you want to make sure you have a way to quantify the score or this impact to the client the best way to do that ultimately is through dollars like david is saying you know the the meaningful metric that we all care about in business but but when it comes to your risk score or risk profile you can do it in a variety of different ways on on a scale like we're talking and be very effective because now that client we're competitive by nature we want to know how do i get to a thousand how do i get to ten how do i get to four you know and they're going to ask those types of questions and then you can go through your assessment and figure out what were the low scored areas? What's what's pulling that average down and have a meaningful conversation with them? Well, I've always been a huge fan of making it a financial discussion as much as possible because that's what people are going to be interested in in talking about. And too often the, the financial discussion revolves around premium and it shouldn't. Yeah. You know, so you know, one of the tricks, and I've I've talked about it on the podcast a couple of times, but one of the tricks that I use that I, I like a lot is I like to assume a revenue level that's not going to offend that person. So if I think they're doing eight, I'm going to say 10 yeah. because <laughs> you don't want to go to somebody who's doing 8 million in revenue and say, hey, I, I eyeball you guys to do about 5 million in revenue, <laughs> yeah. right? That's not like, well, no, well. actually we're almost double that friend, you know? So you always want to be a little bit high on that. And then I always am going to be a little bit high on what I estimate their profit margin to be. Okay. So, you know, maybe they're, they're a 7% net profit. I'm going to put them at 10. And the reason why I do that is because when we do the total cost of risk calculation, I want to show them what the total cost of risk is relative to the total profit dollars brought into the organization over the course of the year. And then we take it a step further and I like to break it down to show them how many days they have to work each year at that profit margin and their revenue numbers just to overcome the total cost of risk. And, you know, on average, it could be a month, month and a half. If it's a, a somewhat hairy account, I saw one that was a year and a half. Holy cow. Yeah. Lost sensitive comp plan, highly hazardous business had no controls in place. And when you, when you did all the numbers, like, it's like, how could you even do that? Well, honestly, they were going out of business. You can't, and they were going out of business yeah. Yeah. for all those reasons. Yeah. So, well, and, and I want to be everybody listening that sometimes I feel like people think it's overcomplicated, right? Like, wow, I just, I don't really know what total cost of risk seems complex, David. And I don't really know how to do that. It doesn't have to be that complex. Like you are working with business owners on a daily basis. You know, a lot of times what they're facing. Just create your simple list of questions, you know, and then put a scoring metric to that. And you're 90% of the way there, you know, because you've got something that they can hold. Because something David mentioned, the premium is usually what people look at as our as our grade, right? So like let's let's use this That's example. That's because we're not talking to them about anything else quantifiable. Bingo. Though. Bingo. hundred percent So if we're not, then and they're using premium, we could do everything right throughout the year. We could drive. Uh, all of the right risk management metrics. We should, we could have light duty return to work programs. We could have everything in place and they just have five large work comp claims. Well, guess what's going to happen to their work comp premium? It's going to go up. But we, as their advisor, did all of the right things and provided them with a ton of value. But they're going to look at that as, as their premium went up. That's how they, that's our scorecard. And so now they need to go look. Well, let's give them something else. To, to view as our scorecard. Let's give them a score that says we can go to them and ask some questions. Hey, you know what? How are we handling return to work? Did that go well in these claims? Oh yeah, it was great. I'm so glad you guys implemented that. Like, great. That's a high score. You know, all the things that we worked on throughout the year. And if that improves that score, now the client can look at us and say, 
yeah, man, it was a bad year. I, I understand why the carriers got to do it. You guys, we got to keep, keep this thing going so we can drive this down next year, you know, because they're seeing that we're doing the job. So we have to take control of what that scorecard is. And that's what these scoring and quantification metrics can do. It's probably one of the biggest things that we found with, with the scoring that we built within launch. Yeah. But I mean, realistically, I could take somebody who's one day on the job as a producer first day, got to be licensed first day though. They log into launch. They've got an account. They can immediately start doing what they need to do to win that business with no experience whatsoever because of how you click your way through the dashboard to be able to build those Bingo. questions and, and quantification and everything. Or they could come in and just send out the link to however many prospects that they want to fish with the net for. Like, I mean, how hard would it be if you said, you know what, I'm only working this hundred prospects this month or this week, whatever it is, depends on how hard you want to work, but you're going to just a finite number but I am going to work the living daylights out of that. I'm going to start out by telemarketing. Uh, if I don't get anywhere, I'm going to send them a link via email to see if I can get them to take this risk assessment so that we can quantify it. I'm going to go back and follow up with them again over the phone to see if they had a chance to review it. You know, my system's going to tell me whether it's been opened or not. I'm assuming I don't want to talk out of turn, yeah. you know. Do they know yeah. if the lick has been clinked and uh, clicked and opened and yeah, all that you, stuff? Yeah, you get the results of exactly how they answered all the questions. But yep. what if they open it and they don't answer anything? Do you know that too? We don't know that. No, they have okay. to. They have to go through and answer them. Yep. Got it. So you know, we wouldn't scratch that part of it, but we're going to assume that they opened it. And even if they didn't, we're going to call. I'm so used to using HubSpot, man. I know when everybody opens yeah. everything. Um, yeah. But you um, could, but you could attach the link to our assessment into a HubSpot and it, campaign it would and do it. It would tell, me the, second, yeah. it would oh, tell yeah. me the second that that link is clicked. Bingo. Yeah, yeah, you the emails yeah. open, the, the, the link is clicked. And so, yeah, right. that makes a good, that's a good point. But you, then I could follow back up with telemarketing again and say, hey, look, I saw that you clicked the link to take our survey. Do you have any questions about it? Whatever else you could actually go buy, you know, and, and follow up on it that way. I mean, none of what I just said, did I say, quote, gather information, ask for loss runs, not one. I'm just talking about general sales activity that we're not doing. Why? Yeah. Because it doesn't involve quoting. Totally. I mean, there's some agencies that are using this uh, tool that are presenting it to a client, asking for the BOR just to go through the process. They won't even go through the risk assessment, go through any of the reporting or anything until the client is, or until the prospect is a client. Um, and so they're using it as just a sales tool to get the business day one. And then they're going in and saying, hey, now we'll work on your behalf because you were a prospect or, or we work only for clients. Right. Type of and that, you know, that's one end of the spectrum. I doubt, I don't think everybody's going to go that route, but it shows what's possible. Agreed. Well, I want to be respectful of time, man. We're coming up on an hour. It does not seem like that. Have we been yeah, going for an hour? Yeah. 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 You were fired up today. You're ready to go. Fired I up. was, man. It's been a little while. You know, I got a weekend to relax a little bit, came in a little strong. So <laughs> just chugging <laughs> cabs and just yeah. totally fired up. Yeah. I got a... Yeah, it was a great trip, man. We had a good time. So it did give me enough time to be relaxed, but I definitely did come back wound up too. So anything before we wrap this thing up that we haven't covered that you want to make sure that people um people know. And number that's the first part. And then number two, people, he's you know, he's gonna tell you how to get a hold of him. I mean, I can connect you with Elliot anytime you need me to, but he's gonna tell you how to get a hold of him direct. So yeah, lay it out there, man. What what did we miss? If there's anything else you need him to know before we wrap up and then let him know where to get the goods. Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing we didn't really dive into was the client planning piece, which I think is a very important part of the sales process that Often gets but overlooked. Here's the deal. We're going to do a complimentary webinar on client planning. Uh, you can tell me when we're going to do it, but you can demo your software. We can talk about why it's important because I Perfect. do think it's important. So it may be uh, next month or maybe even after the first of the year, we'll have to see. But I think th what you're talking about is important. And I know it's going to take a little bit of time for us to go through it. Yeah. And that's one that I think people that's need fair. to see visually as well. So you've got, you've got it here first. We need to get four or 500 agents on a webinar and let Elliot show you about you know, the dashboard and, and the user interface and how all that stuff works, but through a very important part of the process. So just, yep. you don't need to try and explain it. We'll, we'll, we'll put it out we'll there just, and let them see it. 
Yeah, that's even better. So that is, is super important. So that's probably a better way to walk through it anyways. Um, but no, I appreciate the time. Anybody can get a hold of me through, you know, you can go to our website, getlaunch.io, and there's a form there you can submit. We'll reach out or just email me directly. It's E as in Elliot Bassett, B-A-S-S-E-T-T, at mylaunch.io, and you'll get a hold of me. So we're, I'm always happy to jump on, talk to people about, you know, sales process in general, about launch. I just, I love getting this message out. I think it's where the industry is going. I think we all need to be working towards that in our industry and uh, looking forward to any of those discussions anybody wants to have. Sweet. So here's the thing, people. This is where Elliot thinks the industry is going. This is something that I've been talking to you about for years at this point. The only way it's ever going to change is in your it change in your agency is if you make the decision that it's going to. It's got to start with you. It's not that you don't know the tricks. You can listen to every episode of this podcast and walk away with at least one thing that you can use on the streets that day that will work and make a difference in how you go about your business. It's just a matter of you taking that information and executing. So that's all I have to say. Kyle was getting ready to say something before I railroaded him and, and uh, talked on top of Fired him. Up. So it, it looked like you were getting ready to say something, man. What was it? Was it, was it about people leaving a review? Well, I have to say that's been, that's, that's been an issue we've been trying to overcome for quite some time. People, come on. It's the holiday season. We're thankful. We're thankful for all, for all of you. We'd be even more thankful if you would just jump on, leave us a nice little review on wherever you listen, throw some stars or tell us we suck. And then whatever, then just, yeah, just put your name. I mean, I, if you're not happy with this, that's fine. I just want to know who it is. Yeah, because I'll remember name, stuff address, like that cell phone number. Yeah, I'll, I'll remember stuff we'll have, like that. We'll have Ethan come topic. egg your house. It'll be sweet. <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, I mean, it's crazy, man, because I do feel like we provide a lot of value. And I know that people paid to buy my most recent book. Um, but there's a lot of value in that book, too, not just because I wrote it, but because it's the actual system that I've used. And I know that it works. But by God, I've sold thousands of copies of the book and I've got 30 reviews on Amazon. How does that happen? Like, just take some time out of your day. Give your give your boy thirty seconds. I don't even care, you know. Just give me book book good in <laughs> in five stars. I'm good with that. Okay, that's all I need. But anyhow, listen, Elliot. How do they find you, man? Where do they reach out? Yep. So just go, you can go to our website getlaunch.io or my email ebassett at mylaunch.io. Um, and that's I'm B A S S. Yeah, B A S S E T T E Bassett. You got it. Yep. Yep. So I love it, man. Thanks for having me on. This is fun. Uh, it went fast. So uh, yeah, I'll look forward to doing that webinar on uh, client plans. And it'll be good. It'll be a good one, man. Talk to you soon, brother. Take care. See you guys. You've been listening to the Power Producers Podcast. You can follow Killing Commercial Insurance on Facebook and YouTube. And if you want to take your game to the next level, next level, check out our book, The Extra Two Minutes. And our website, Killing Commercial.